Good morning, everybody. Hoping you're all well today. Um, this morning, we're going to discuss evaluating your business. Um, thank you for joining us on evaluating your business. My name is Christy Wilt, and I am the Director of Planning, Tourism, and Economic Development for Hamilton County. I'm also the Executive Director of the Hamilton County Industrial Development Agency. I am one of two Hamilton County liaisons for the Adirondack North Country Association Center for Business Transition. We wanna take a moment from our office just to give you a brief description of what our office does. We promote tourism throughout Hamilton County and the Adirondack region. We host our tourism website, adirondackexperience.com, our relocation website, adirondackgoodlife.com, and our government site, hamiltoncounty.com. Those are all managed out of our little two-person office. The Hamilton County uh, Industrial Development Agency, like most others, administers low interest revolving loan funds to Hamilton County entrepreneurs. We can provide working capital, gap financing, business purchase money, real estate loans, uh, monies for equipment and min inventory. We could basically do anything um, to help you out financially, except for we do not do construction costs. Hard time, you'll also find me working for Alicia C. Miller Real Estate in Southern Hamilton County as a real estate salesperson. I've been assisting buyers and sellers since about 2005. Um, so that's a little about what I do. And now I want to introduce my assistant, who's also a liaison for the Center in Business Transition. Her name is Rochelle Mark. Uh, Rochelle, can you tell us a little bit about what you do here at Hamilton County? Sure. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my job here at Hamilton County entails promoting our region and so to do this, I work closely with the Regional Office of Sustainable Tourism, who's our marketing partner out of the Lake Placid area. Uh, I write blogs for AdirondackExperience.com and seasonal tidbits about the area on AdirondackGoodLife.com. I send information to potential travelers and answer their questions when they call. I try to be the best resource I can for our visitors. I also manage our regional Adirondack challenges, including our two most popular, which are the fire tower and waterfall hiking challenges. And participants can earn patches for completing each challenge. The idea is to get them motivated to spend more time in our county and complete them or to come <clears throat> back at a later time. I also organize our annual free Adirondack Boreal Birding Festival held every June. It's one of our shoulder season events where folks spend four days countywide participating in walks, hikes, lectures, and driving safaris, looking for boreal birds in their natural habitat. We also help with the Great Adirondack Garage Sale, another weekend long shoulder event. By doing these events on a countywide level, we hope to add a little economic stimulus to our county for our local businesses. I work to keep business listings on adirondackexperience.com and hamiltoncounty.com up to date and report those listings for the Center for Business and the Transition. Every couple of weeks, I scour the county, check, county checking real estate sites and postings to keep the list of business offerings throughout the county current. The Center for Businesses in Transition is nearing the end of its second year, but has already serviced 100 prospective transitioning businesses, two interested business investors, and 46 aspiring entrepreneurs looking to review their available business options. We have over 98 organizations and community leaders that support the partnership throughout the 14 county North Country region. The efforts of the CBIT liaisons have resulted in over 33,568 businesses and individuals being reached by liaisons efforts. 326 business owners and 122 aspiring entrepreneurs engaging in direct dialogue with a civic liaison. At the Center for Businesses and Transition, we address the loss of area businesses by providing matchmaking services with potential buyers, access to planning tools, and connecting them with existing services. The Center is a dynamic partnership between regional organizations and individuals invested in the retention of local business and the future of our communities. The goal is to help owners sell their businesses on the open market, complete intergenerational family transition, or to help a business convert to an employee owned or cooperative model. If you're a business owner that's looking to retire or transfer ownership and you need assistance navigating resources, finding suitable successors or accessing capital, the Center for Businesses in Transition is here to assist you. 
If you're an aspiring entrepreneur looking to purchase an existing business, start a new career path toward business ownership, or learn more about employee ownership and opportunities, the center has a collaborative support list of folks like economic developers, loan program specialists, and many other resources to help you. While we call it a center, there really is no one location. Community liaisons and lead partners are spread across the North Country. The CBIT program has many resources to help both buyers and sellers. All of the liaisons are friendly and more than willing to help in whatever way we can. The website for the CBIT www.ownanorthcountrybusiness.com and there you can find helpful information as well as our new guidebook. Uh, next, I would like to introduce Danny Delaney. She's a fireball. I don't know how this working mama ever sleeps. She spreads, she spearheads the program for the Adirondack North Country Association Center for Businesses and Transition through transformational services throughout the North Country. She puts together all these great programs and workshops and her dedication and enthusiasm for this project is unmeasurable. She keeps us all motivated. Hi, Danny. <laughs> all right. Okay. So next up, uh, we are going to welcome our first panelist, Angela Smith. Uh, she's from the Small Business Development Center at SUNY Canton. Angela is one of our lead partners at CBIT. She works in assisting North Country entrepreneurs and small businesses through advising, training, and research. Additionally, the SBDC provides much needed services to manufacturers, women, veterans, minority, and physically challenged individuals, or on businesses impacting distressed and targeting, targeted areas. Counseling services are free and confidential. They also assist with business plans to help you get one of those low interest loans offered by men, our many industrial development agencies and alliances. Their services are mostly free of charge. By assisting new and existing small business firms, the SBDC directly contributes to local, regional and state economics, promoting stability and growth. Our other panelist today is Kim Mannion. Uh, she's the former owner of Maui North Ski Bike and Board in downtown Plattsburgh. Kim has experience selling her own business as an asset sale and will hopefully give us some great tips from the seller's perspective. Kim and Angela, who would like to start? Thank you so much, Christy and Rachel, for having us and Danny for experiencing the uh, partnership. I'm just going to bring up my PowerPoint real quick. Share my screen. Hi, so today we're here to talk about small business valuation, right? So if you're planning to exit your business, you need to know how much your business is worth. So today we're going to talk about the process, right, of assigning value to a business. So I think most of us know that a professional valuation can be expensive. So it's important for you to know when you need a professional valuation and when a ballpark estimate might be sufficient, right? So are you selling business assets? Are you selling shares of stock? If gifting a business to potentially some of your family members, right? So depending what you're trying to do, um, you might require a professional business valuation, which you know, from prices that we've spoken to different CPAs about could be $2,500 to $20,000. One of the businesses I'm working with is larger and you know, they had a couple of different business units. So it's more expensive, the bigger and more complex of a business that you do own. The great thing is when you start with the SBDC, um, we can help get the conversation started at no cost to you. That way you're a little bit more prepared it comes time to engage the professional. So hopefully if you don't require as much time and attention on your professional valuation, you can save yourself money by starting the conversation with the SBDC. Now, full disclosure, SBDC advisors are not allowed to provide legal or tax advice. What we do is we provide you with information to help you be in the best possible situation to make an informed, an informed decisions. So let's take a quick peek at how the SBDC can help, right? So what's my business worth? Great question, and we get this quite a bit. 
The answer is it depends, right? Um, last week when we were talking with Doug Hoffman, CPA, um, he said buyers are looking to buy a business with proven systems and processes. So you have to ask yourself, as you're looking to sell your business, are you selling a business or have you created a nice job for yourself and potentially more selling a, a job and a lifestyle, right? So building value in a business to make it sellable depends on several factors, right? So according to Value Builder Systems, which is a company that focuses exclusively on helping business owners build more sellable and valuable businesses, the value of a business is determined by looking at eight key drivers. The higher your overall score, the more sellable and valuable your business is. If, as you look at these different drivers, you realize, whoa, I'm really, you know, my business is highly dependent on me as an owner, ask yourself, what can you do to make the business more independent so that it makes it more sellable, right? That's why we say it takes two to three years at a minimum, uh, oftentimes to prepare a business for sale because a business isn't perfect and there's things you can do to increase the value if you allow time to be on your side. So driver number one, right? Cash is king. Uh, how much money does your business make? Do you show a healthy profit on your tax returns? Um, you have to remember that tax returns are everything because most buyers are not going to be cash for your business. They're going to need to secure funding. Therefore, the historical performance of the business becomes really important. And buyers are not going to pay for things that are off the books. Growth potential, right? So have you tapped, for example, the entire market? Do you have a really limited market for your business? Or is there lots of additional potential? Sometimes a business owner is towards the end of their career, so they're not interested in taking on additional projects that could grow the business. But think about how you can feature the potential growth to a future buyer to make your business more attractive. Suppliers, employees, and customers. So um, Value Builder refers to this section as the Switzerland model because if you are too dependent on a few key employees, right, a few key uh, customers, like think about it, if most of your business is with one uh, customer and it's Walmart, if they decide that they no longer want to do business with you, that's tremendously risky, right? So as a business owner, look at your suppliers, employees, and customers and try and think how you can diversify and make sure that you're not too dependent on any one group. Working capital needs, right? So how much of a cash cushion do you need in the bank, right, to run this business? Are you highly seasonal where some businesses require $100,000 every season to get restarted? When someone buys your business, they have to write two checks, one for you to buy the business from you and another one to fund the working capital. So the higher the working capital needs, the less attractive a business could be to a buyer. The uh, fifth one is reoccurring revenue, right? So think about it this way. How easy or difficult is it to generate sales in your business? Do you have a subscription model, right? Like Netflix or uh, other type businesses where it's just reoccurring every month or every week, you know, your credit card gets billed. Um, so it's the sales are a little bit more built in, or are you a vacuum case salesman that has to go door to door knocking to make sales? That's an extremely difficult uh, way to potentially generate revenue. Uniqueness and difference in competition, right? So are you able to set your prices, right? Or are you selling a commodity product where it is very limited margins to work on? Um, how many people sell a similar type of product? And the most important here is do your customers see value in what you're doing or can they easily switch to a competitor because you're a me too business? Customer satisfaction, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. If your business, you know, the reviews online are atrocious, that depreciates your business. So um, take time to address those, clean that up and learn from customer feedback. And the final one is, can the business operate without the owner? Again, if everything is in your head, the processes, people do business because they like you as an owner, it's very difficult 
uh, to separate yourself from the business. A great test, as Doug mentioned last week, is take a vacation. Does the business fall apart if you try and leave for two weeks? Or does the, does the business continue running smoothly because you have you know, good managers and processes in place to keep going? So to a buyer looking to acquire a business, it's all about future cash flow and risk, right? Um, think about it this way. If someone has you know, $100,000 to put as a down payment for the business, they could also invest that in the stock market and get a return of 5 to 10%. So typically, someone looking to buy a business is going to be looking, is going to be looking for potentially a little bit more of a higher return than what a passive investment in the stock market would give them. Of course, it's not always about money, right? Sometimes people want to work for themselves. It's been their lifelong dream. They want to work with their spouse. But ultimately, the business needs to generate enough cash to keep the doors open and for the owner to be able to pay their bills. So again, it does come down to money to a certain extent. So just real quick, I won't go through all of these, but sellers with some work and planning can absolutely increase the value of their business, uh, cleaning up books, making sure you're showing, you know, taking out some of the owner perks that probably shouldn't be there, um, you know, building up your management team, uh, cleaning up your business, right? Mowing the lawn, fresh coat of paint, things like that. Just like you would get a house ready to put on the market, you would go through similar things um, in business ready to be on the market. So how does the SBDC work with clients to uh, start the conversation about what a business is worth? We use what's called rule of thumb valuation. So we ask clients to bring in about three, last three years of tax returns. And then we'll take a look at things like sales, cost of goods, um, identify net profit or seller's disposable income by backing out all those owner perks. Then we would contact our research network, which is our four full-time librarians down in Albany that do research for us. And they pull data from uh, the business reference. Guide. This is a book that's published every year that gives multipliers for restaurants, retail, like all kinds of business, all kinds of businesses. And these multipliers take into account uh, businesses that have sold in your industry over the last 10 years and other algorithms to kind of come up with these industry multipliers. What we then do once we can look at your tax return and I identified sales and um, earning before interest taxes and depreciation is that we would look at the published multipliers and take into account those eight drivers of value. So let's just take an example, a full service restaurant that generates $220,000 in um, earning before taxes. The multipliers would say to use two to three times, right? A multiplier. So do you pick two or do you pick three, right? In this example at 2.5, the, the value of your business is determined to be about a half a million dollars. So think about it this way. Are you an economic diner that sells world famous pies that people want to, right? That's called an enhanced business. Um, you would probably be able to ask three times or more the value, you know, based on this multiplier. But if you're a tired business owner who's been neglecting the business for two years and duct tape is holding up the benches, you probably can't even get a two. That's why valuation, when we work with clients, give you a range, right? A high and a low based on discussion, based on review of tax returns and research that will pull uh, from industry kind of trends. So, um, you know, again, I like starting the conversation with valuation, but the biggest problem that we see day in and day out with valuation is they come out high. And the problem is if you list too high, buyers are just going to ignore your business and won't even work with you. So, um, you know, you as an owner might be making you know, a nice profit, maybe 50,000, and that's fine for you. But a new business owner is going to have that. A few people can pay cash. So now if we subtract the debt payment from the profit, there might be 20,000 or 30,000 left. Is that still really interesting for someone to acquire that business and eke out a living? 
So that's why Kim is going to talk about next cash flow um, and analysis and why that becomes a really important tool when talking about uh, selling. <clears throat> Stop sharing. Okay, dokie. Let's see. Do you want to continue? Hold on. <clears throat> All righty. All right. So we are going to go through a um, case study on selling a business. Uh, we're going to go through a lot of numbers. And so while we generally ask folks to hold questions till the end. If you have questions as I'm going through this, please don't hesitate to just ask your question via the chat and somebody can bring it up. <clears throat> so, whoops, where is my, oh, there we go. All right, so lots and lots of numbers here. You are going, this is Beverly's Bike Shop and I am actually gonna speak to both the buying of Maui North, as well as potentially the selling of Maui North. Um, so I made it Beverly's Bike Shop. This is a fictitious shop, but uh, it represents kind of the, the process that I went through. So first, you're going to want to, as Angela mentioned, you're going to want to bring together three years of tax returns, P&Ls, that kind of thing, because you're wanting, going to want to come up with a three-year average on some of these numbers. One of the first key numbers is going to be your three-year average on revenue. That is one of the easier numbers that it'll that you know your top line number is pretty easy to come up with. Net income is a pretty in, important one. You're going to want to back out certain things to get to EBITDA. Um, these are all kind of interest, depreciation, taxes, amortization, that kind of thing. I know a lot of folks are comfortable and are familiar with depreciation, which is where you buy an asset for 20 grand and you expense it on your PL over the, the life of the asset. Amortization is the same thing for like trademarks, things that you would, uh, money that you would pay for a trademark, franchises, that kind of thing. So backing those numbers out gets us to EBITDA, which is another key number that we'll apply multipliers to of 111,000. If we continue on, and Angela mentioned backing out all of the owner benefits that you as an owner have. So it could be additional payroll that you have. Um, you're running your fuel and car maintenance through your business. You wanna back that out. Um, if you own your building you want, and you're paying yourself a higher than market rent, you're gonna to wanna to add that back in. And then any kind of one-time um, expenses that you've run through the business, whether it's, um, they talk about landscaping or personal vacations, and I'm not entirely sure how you run that through your business from a tax perspective, but it, it's included. And as Angela mentioned, one of the key, key numbers that you're gonna wanna get to is what's called seller's discretionary earnings. And in this case, it's about 140,000. So this is the amount of cash basically that, and this owner is able to pull out of this business. And it is one of the key metrics that we are going to look at. Angela mentioned the reference guides or valuation guides. These are guides that give you, first off, an overview of the industry. You know, what's the size of the industry, both from a, how many businesses are in it, uh, revenue, is it growing, is it contracting, that kind of thing. And then more importantly for our application are these rule of thumb multipliers. So we talked about annual sales or revenue. For a bike shop, you would multiply and we'll actually do this, but your revenue by 20% on the low end, 30% on the high end to get your valuation. EBITDA, you would multiply that number by three to get to another approach on valuation. And then, and I forgot to mention, um, you will have to add inventory into that as well. And that is a whole separate um, valuation and negotiation piece that we'll talk about. But SE, SCE for a bike shop, you would multiply by 1.5 on the low end, 2.5 on the high end. And I thought it would be helpful to look at these rules of thumb for other industries just to get a sense of how industry specific these multipliers are. So you can see a, fl a florist only has an EBITDA multiplier of two, whereas somehow a specialty retail gift shop has an EBITDA multiplier of four, a bike shop has three. Similarly, the 
revenue number, the multipliers are all over the place, you know, from a low of 15% to a high of 35% for a florist. Sometimes you get to add the inventory back in. In the case of florist, that inventory is, is included in that, uh, in that valuation. So here we go. Uh, let's go back to our three-year P&L uh, and start to apply some of these multipliers. So these are the multipliers. So first we take that 856,000 and change. We multiply those, that number by the low and high end multipliers to come up with the valuations. And actually I can't see it. I think it's 171,000. Somehow the, uh, <laughs> the people are over my screen. Um, a high end multiplier in the twos, uh, the EBITDA multiplier, right? Another one that we talked about, that one only has one but we get to, when we multiply the EBITDA, we get to 333,000. If we do the SDE of 141,000, we multiply that by the low and high multipliers and we come up with those, those valuations. And as you can see, these valuations are pretty broad with a, a low end at 171, the high end valuation of 152,000 and change. That's $181,000 difference. And how do you narrow that down? And Angela spoke to this when she talked about the trends in revenue. Is your revenue margin the good things trending up or are those things trending down? And obviously that would affect your future growth potential. Like I don't need to go through these things because Angela spoke to these, but if this is where you may want to engage with a professional, because you, I don't, if you're a seller, I don't think you have an objective view on your business, right? This is your life's work potentially. And, uh, and so engaging with a professional, whether it's a professional um, valuation expert, the SBDC, your accountant, that kind of thing, um, that's that. So we've talked about valuing the business and, and that is kind of the intangible, we call it goodwill, right? And it's, it's essentially what the business is worth as a going concern. Then we need to talk about the assets. In this case, we have inventory that's valued on the books at a half a million dollars. We have furniture fixtures and equipment valued at about $30,000. You may have a website, you may have a front end website if you're an e-commerce that's consider that's worth a lot of money, there may be real estate involved. And I didn't include the real estate for the purposes of simplicity here. So we add the low end valuation of 171 plus these numbers to get a total business valuation of about $700,000. If we go with the high end valuation, we get a, a total business valuation of almost $900,000. Again, quite a range. So again, this is somebody's life work and they want to go and put it on the market at top dollar. So we then, and this is the process that I went through, uh, Matt was on the market for quite a bit of money and being a little uh, number nerd that I am and working for the SBDC, I did some number crunching and, uh, and put the cash flow together and it didn't work. And you'll see in this instance at the high end value, it, it just doesn't work. Um, First, I just want to talk, uh, Angela spoke to working capital and the need for working capital if you're going to buy a seasonal business. And I, I promise this is the only time I'm going to torture you with a monthly cash flow. Going forward, I'm going to roll it up to an annual cash flow. So a bike business is highly seasonal, right? Uh, in January, doing about 20,000 in business. The summer months, almost 150,000 in business. Regardless of the seasonal nature of your business, you are going to have fixed expenses that are same that you that that are the same regardless of the level of business that you're doing. Things like rent, insurance, your communications, utilities, those are things you can't control. And it directly affects your net cash flow. Right? We the high-end debt service, and we'll get to calculating this in just a second, is 10 grand a month, right? That's a big nut. Right, so it makes your, your cash flow. If you were to buy this business during these months, let's say you bought the business and you closed in January, in addition to the financing that you would need in order to buy the business, you would also need an additional 
in the 50 in $50,000 in working capital to be able to pay your bills to get to summer. It's not quite as grim in the fall, but it's almost 20 grand, right? So you really need to take that into consideration. It also is, again, one of those negotiation points that affects the value of the company. So we rolled our monthly cash flow into an annual cash flow. And we have our sales, we have, you know, we back out all of those expenses, the your payroll, your rent, workers' comp, all of that. And we get to that cash flow of about 140,000, which is what we said it was with the, uh, that was the seller's discretionary earnings. Now let's talk about financing, right? We have the total valuation at almost 900,000. We're going to assume because we can, uh, that you're going to put about 20% down, which is a pretty normal number. We're going to finance the rest at 6% for seven years. Again, fairly standard. You could go longer, shorter, but for the purposes of this, those are the terms we're going to use. Your financing will take many, many forms. Right? You may be able to get it from a bank. You might work with some of the gap lenders that are on the call. Uh, it may be the owner. It may be Aunt Judy. There's going to be a number of different people that will help you fund this. But again, for the purposes of this, we're going to roll it all up into this $706,000 that you're going to finance. The monthly payments at 6% over seven years are $10,000. And it gets you to an annual debt service of almost $124,000. And, and, and as Angela mentioned, you back that out from $137,000 and it leaves you with $13,000, right? I'm pretty sure that no one would want to um, buy a business and take on the risk and the work for $13,000. So chances are the buyer and similar to what I did, is gonna go back with a low end valuation on the goodwill and negotiate the value of the inventory. <clears throat> the inventory may be on the books at a half a million dollars, but in the case of a bike shop, a lot of it will be very dated actually very quickly, right? And so you end up with <clears throat> dated inventory that you can't sell at full retail. You're selling it at a discounted rate. And so that is part of the negotiation that a seller and buyer will go through is they'll negotiate the value of the, of the inventory. So in this instance, we're value, we're, we have 171,000, about 95,000 in down payment. We get to a debt service of 66,000 for the year, which gets to a net cash flow of 71,000, right? That's a much more doable number in my opinion right? Maybe it's worth it for somebody to do it for that. Maybe it's not. And again, being the number nerd that I am, I would say that you would want to then go through and, and we can help you do this, uh, put a little table together that looks like this. So we have our low, medium, and high ends on the goodwill. We have our low, medium, and high ends on the valuation of the inventory. And don't be afraid. This there's a lot of numbers, but so we're going to get a, to a total purchase price on these, the amount that you're going to finance, monthly payments, annual debt service, and then the most important number is what is your income after your debt service, right? So, and this is all the, the nuanced art of negotiation, right? You are going to have to put a little bit in for furniture fixtures and equipment, but the negotiation of the goodwill number and the inventory number is a dance, right? This is a seller's life's work, right? They're gonna to wanna to get more top dollar on the value of the goodwill than they will the inventory. But again, just understand what your number as a seller is, your uh, best case scenario, and what is your walk away number? And then the same is true with a buyer, right? Like what is the number that you are comfortable with in terms of what you think you can get out of the business? Um, now, obviously you're gonna to aspire to grow the business and you have uh, ideas and that's all of that goes into the negotiation, but that is kind of where. So there's lots and lots of numbers. If, if you're thinking, holy mother of God, how will I ever put these numbers together? Consider working with a professional, right? Like we love this stuff. <laughs> um, 
And clearly valuation is much more of an art than it is a science. Um, whatever number you put out there, be able to defend that number by having gone through a pretty tight cash flow analysis because a good buyer is going to go through that process and you want to be able to preempt that and understand what the cash flow is. And under, as a seller, understand what your motivations are. If you're right in the beginning stages and you have three to five years that you're thinking about, you've planned, that's a very different position that somebody's really ready to move on. And that person needs to be a little bit more flexible and um, willing to, to perhaps take less of a purchase price or perhaps be willing to hold more paper, that kind of thing. So. Anyway, that's where we're at with that. Apparently I was, looks like I was pretty clear because there was no questions, but <laughs> I know it's a sea of numbers. So thanks, back to everybody. So next up, Christy, do you want to talk a little bit about what you like to see when listing a business as a real estate agent? Uh, sure. Uh, well, do you ever wonder why you see a business sitting for years on the real estate marketplace in our area in our region, uh, it's because they're not an easy sell. You're not just buying a business, you're buying a lifestyle in a small community. Um, you're taking a risk knowing that the shoulder seasons could be slow. It, it, it's just not easy to do. So determining fair market value for your business can seem like a daunting task. Um, after all, it's something most of you have built from the ground up. It's like raising a child. You saw it through the good times and the bad, and usually there's a lot of emotions tied with letting it go. Uh, the first thing you need to do and think about when you're ready to sell, I would say um, you're probably the only one who can decide when it's the right time for you to sell, but you should consider thinking about your exit plan long before you're ready to sell, at least three years prior. Um, start, start considering uh, that. Once you think the time is right, uh, real estate professionals can be of assistance. Uh, we work together with you to determine the value of your business. Um, find an agent you trust, one you feel comfortable with sharing your most intimate business financials with, because basically from here on out, you're going to you're gonna work as a team. Uh, I like to think of selling a business in three factors. You have the nature of your business, the annual revenues of your business, and your seller's discretionary earnings. So those are the owner benefits. So amortization, depreciation, owner compensation, health insurance, car payments, cell phones, et cetera. Anything that benefits the owner, that the owner is receiving from the business, um, you, want, you want to consider. So um, how will we work together to find an approximate value for your business? Well, we'll work with your accountant, look at your tax returns, your profit and loss statements and other financial records. Now I know you'll find this shocking, but not all business owners report all income on their tax returns. So uh, the easiest way to determine a value for your business is to compare it to other similar businesses that have sold. So say for example, you're selling a coffee shop. As real estate agents, we have a database of businesses that have sold. We can then sort that data and narrow the results to find coffee shops that have sold that closely mirror your style of business. Uh, they may not be exact match, but it'll give us a start. So then we look at the value of the real estate if the business owns real estate. Uh, in actuality, your tax returns are the highest and best evidence of your business value once you know how to use them. So for an example, we'll go back to that coffee shop. Let's say that coffee shop has $500,000 in annual revenue. And let's say the tax revenue for the prior year was $50,000, but that doesn't represent the owner benefits. So here, I would make a few addbacks for those benefits. You're probably asking what are owner, you know, owner benefits go back to those things. The business is paying for your cell phone. Maybe you're renting and living above the business, those kinds of things. So let's say the owner's salary is part of the benefits at $40,000 a year. And maybe she claimed $25,000 in depreciation and they amortize another 20,000. I would add back to the value of that business, the $50,000 salary, the depreciation, the amortization and some other common items like health insurance, car payments, cell phone payments, whatever business expenses benefit that owner that that business paid for, we add back to the revenue. 
So as you can see, when we add back these items, the total owner benefits will easily exceed $100,000 in this instance. So we can take those owner benefits and get a total. For this coffee shop, it is now a revenue of $150,000. So now looking at that, I would go in and look at our commercial sale database, which will reveal the percentage of owner benefits to the amount the business may sell for. So maybe our chart reveals the business will sell for 1.5 times the owner benefits with $500,000 in sales. Once we can determine the owner benefits, most agents who sell commercial real estate will be able to provide you with a low, high, and a medium average for your business. And we call this process comparable market analysis. Um, pricing your business correctly is key to selling it and generating buyer interest. Buyers, no surprise here, shy away from overpriced businesses, just like overpriced houses. Also by working with a seller and taking a look at their businesses in light, it may help to take away a little of that emotional attachment to the business and ease the seller's mind. Emotional, I think, are usually the hardest part of selling a business and sometimes they govern the owner's pricing. Uh, depending on your business, you may take a look at its ex, ex, sorry, assets. Consider the business assets, which are not part of the discretionary earnings. Consider the value of the real estate. We would value that separately, add it back in. Some fixed assets that might be included in the sale, like registers, computers, used to run the company or other items. Some sort of significant equipment needed to run that business, like for this example, a giant coffee mill or an expensive espresso machine. If those are staying with the business, we need to give them some sort of value too. So most of these sales are asset sales, but for time to time you have liability involved. So liability might be where a new buyer assumes an existing note or maybe paid time off to employees or unpaid balances to vendors. These items would be subtracted off the value of the sale price. A good agent will vet any buyer coming to your property. They will make sure the buyer is financially qualified to buy your business long before they step foot in your door. They will ask them to sign confidentiality agreements, anti-discrimination agreements, and agency disclosure long before handing over any of your financial information. As a seller, you need to trust your agent and be willing to share your financials with your potential buyer. These disclosures are in place to protect you. So do not be afraid and I can't stress this enough to interview your agent. You absolutely want to be comfortable if you end up hiring an, a real estate agent. Ask them how they will value your business. Ask them how much they work with commercial properties and how they will vet prospective buyers without scaring the buyers away. Basically, be honest, be transparent, be willing to share both your business knowledge and your financials with your agent. They have a fiduciary duty and an ethical duty to protect you and get you the best price for your business. So to recap, when selling your business, to get a good market value, we basically take the revenues, figure out the seller discretionary earnings, normalize one company versus another similar company, determine free cash flow. Compare to others that have sold, add in tangible assets, take out liabilities, and come up with a stable value. Sounds easy, right? <laughs> that being said, by doing a comparative market analysis, valuation process, it doesn't exactly mean that what the business is going to sell for. Business is only worth what someone is willing to pay, and it will depend also on the market trends. Thank you, Christy. Next on the agenda, let me introduce Chrissy Ways and Peter Jacobson. They are interested in taking over a North Country business. Both aspiring entrepreneurs bring a unique perspective to their search and are public in their efforts. Chrissy or Peter, would you like to start talking about your efforts? Um, sure, I'm glad to start. Uh, hi everyone, uh, this is Peter. Um, I am, uh, yeah, looking for a North Country business to buy. Um, the kind of business I'm interested in is uh, one that I describe as being gritty. And so uh, that means different things to different people. And what it means to me is uh, a gritty business is one that has a safety component, uh, is dirty, uh, unglamorous, uh, low growth, but um, consistently profitable. Um, so anyway, that's a, a two second sort of intro uh, uh, for me.
Peter, thank you so much for introducing yourself. Um, this is Danny from Angus Transition. Um, just a more looking for and has a sort of unique um, you know, I talked to a lot of aspiring business owners who are thinking about taking over an existing business in our region. And he was one of the first ones who really came, I'm going to say with his, uh, oops, sorry, came with his uh, ducks in a row and ready to sort of think about this process really holistically. Uh, Peter, you know, you say sort of like you're looking for a gritty business, you know, what, how, how have you thought about like what will make you successful in taking over that kind of business? What kinds of things are you looking at specifically and, and why do you think this is right for you? Yeah, so um, you know, I'm targeting gritty businesses because I have a background in industrial operations. So I feel like I have the competence to to run that kind of business. Um, you know, I think um, uh, you know when I say like I've worked in industrial operations, that that means that I had experience leading people and improving operations. So I think that should serve me well um, in running any business. Uh, I have some general management training. And then, you know, a big part of being successful uh, when buying a business um, gets to using a rational buying process, which is one that I'm pursuing. So, um, you know, for me, that means buying successful companies that I understand uh, can improve uh, and care about uh, at a reasonable price. So, you know, somebody who loves, um, you know, to go back to the bike store example, somebody that loves bikes and they're a bike enthusiast and you know they're willing to pay any price to own a bike store uh, is typically going to overpay and you know be um, and have a really hard time of it and so by being careful about you know what you pay you give yourself a better chance of actually uh, being successful and making your debt payments and paying yourself and paying your employees um, so i think that discipline will will help me as i look to buy a business Thought about the sort of um, revenue that you're she so um and on that looks like um and how you thinking about Uh, Danny, I don't know if, if everyone else, um, how their connections were, but I, you were coming in and out. Um, is, do you, maybe could you, could you rephrase the question? Maybe type the question in. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. I don't know why, what's happening. Um, so it, I, I was just saying, you know, you've put together a really nice sort of buy sheet to describe the kinds of things that you're looking for. And on there, you indicated a revenue of between 600K to $10 million. Can you, can you talk about how you determine the, the value of the business that you're looking for and the things you're thinking about as you go into that valuation process? Yeah. So when I put together that little one pager, um, you know, I listed, um, you know, the kinds of sectors that I'm interested in and, and also listed some of the um, kind of financial ranges uh, for the companies I was looking at. When I'm thinking about buying, I'm really um, thinking about the EBITDA, uh, which is sort of a, um, uh, an easily comparable profitability metric, which, you know, other speakers have, have talked about. Um, but the fact is, is that not all owners are, um, familiar with that metric, let's say, or even know what that metric is. Um, so I also listed uh, a revenue range. And basically the way I know what my EBITDA range is, which is 200,000 to 1.5 million. And then I, you know, make an assumption about profitability or the EBITDA margin, and that backs me to the revenue numbers. So basically, you know, at 200,000 EBITDA, if it's a really high EBITDA margin of 33%, that yields revenue of 600,000. And then at 1.5 million, if it's a low uh, EBITDA margin of 15%, that means you'd be making $10 million. So that's kind of how I thought about that. And then the way that I thought about the EBITDA range was, um, you know, I wanna make sure that I'm buying a business that is 
has enough profitability to uh, continue to be profitable, even if there is some business fluctuations. So for me, um, the point that I'm comfortable with is that 200,000 level. And then at the high end, it's a question of, you know, what you can finance and how much capital you can bring to bear. Uh, you know, to, for me, uh, a business that's generating 1.5 million, I would need to raise some additional capital, but I think it's reasonable. Um, you know, something that would be much bigger than that would, would probably involve a lot more work um, than I'd be willing to put in, in terms of, of capital raising. And also, you know, the bigger and more profitable a business is, the more complicated it is. And it's a question of, you know, how complicated the thing is that you want to run. So that's a little bit, um, you know, about how I thought about those ranges. Great. And do you mind, and you know, whatever you feel comfortable sharing um, about some of the hurdles or barriers that you faced in sort of starting these conversations and looking at businesses throughout uh, Vermont and upstate New York? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, sometimes people think about uh, financing being a hurdle. And I just talked about how at certain levels, financing would be a hurdle for me. Um, in general, though, you know, uh, Capital is cheap and available right now. Uh, you know, bank interest rate, rates are low, and uh, there's a lot of um, investors have a lot of money and don't know where to put it because uh, the general perception is that the stock market is 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 overvalued. So, fortunately, I think the financing piece is is a little easier right now. Um, the the thing that is a challenge and does concern me is uh, agreeing on a fair price with a seller. And I think you know our current environment with COVID is only making that harder. Uh, we're not in an environment where there's steady state you know earnings are happening. And so you know in 2020, um, you know a lot of businesses that I've seen will uh, have in their teasers uh, that you receive after you sign an NDA. You know, they'll have the financial performance from, you know, 2017 to 2019. And that's, you know, essential. And that's a, a good thing that they provide. But, you know, it's impossible. I, I'm not going to buy anything unless I can see what the 2020 year to date results are, you know, and some businesses um, have done very well in this environment. Um, you know, there was a sawmill that I was looking at that's, you know, on record to have you know, it's best year ever, you know, with, with its earnings being, you know, over 50% what its steady state earnings were. Um, and then conversely, there was a plumbing company that I was looking at that had very consistent earnings in the past. And, you know, and then in the COVID era is, is operating at sort of a break even rate. And the, the issue is that, you know, um, right, there's a bias on both sides. So the seller of the plumbing company is thinking, you know, that their business is still generating 200,000 in EBITDA a year. And, you know, COVID is a one-off disruption and the business should be valued based on 200,000. Um, you know, me as the buyer, I'm, I'm less confident about that. Um, you know, or uh, conversely, the owner of the sawmill uh, who's having their best year ever is again, you know, I you know, maybe um, disingenuously, but is trying to get a valuation on the business based on what I perceive as being a one-time windfall. Um, so, you know, when there's this kind of variability, um, it, it's harder to, to agree. And there are, I mean, fortunately, there are some structures uh, that buyers and sellers can use to bridge this sort of uncertainty. Um, you know, one of these structures is, uh, is, an, is an earnout which is basically you agree to pay uh, a certain price for the business. Like, let's just say it's, you know, $2 million. And, you know, if the business, um, you know, uh, hits certain targets, like with the owner of the sawmill, you know, if they continued to, you know, generate those higher level earnings, uh, me as the buyer would, would pay more money, you know, over time. So maybe at year three, there'd be some kind of basically, it, you can almost think of it as a bonus. For the uh, for the seller, um, you know, there's also uh, one of the other speakers talked about uh, commercial paper or seller notes. So you know, there could be a situation where, let's say, the the owner thinks the business is worth three million. I think it's worth two million, and to bridge the gap, you know, the the seller carries that extra million in forgivable seller notes. So what that means is that if the business is kind of the opposite of a bonus, you know, we'll we'll value the business at that three million dollar level. But, you know, if in year three or year two or whatever the agreement is, the business hasn't performed to that level, 
um, you know, those notes basically are, are forgiven and, and I no longer owe money on those notes. So there's, there's different ways of structuring it. I think the, the challenge with that is, is that as these structures become more complicated, um, it creates, uh, you know, it's something that a lot of sellers are not, um, you know, used, used to and, and are comfortable with. Um, and so that just makes things a little more complicated. So anyway, that was a long answer. Um, but yeah, my concern is agreeing on price in a, you know, disrupted economic environment. Peter, it was a long answer, but it was a great answer. Thank you so much for being so thorough and talking about your search with us. I know that you're very busy doing this pretty much full time trying to find what your next opportunity is. And we appreciate you taking the time to sort of share your story. Um, if you folks have question, more questions for Peter or would like to get in contact, we're happy to share his information as well. Um, and we do have one other aspiring entrepreneur on the line uh, that Rochelle introduced. We have Christy Ways. Uh, Christy, do you want to start, you know, talking about like, what does your search look like? What kind of business are you looking for here in the Adirondack Park country? Oh, I got to get you unmuted. Hey, thank you. Cool. Sorry. Repeat the question one more time. Sorry. What kind of business are you looking for? Tell us um, a little bit about what kind of business you're looking for. <laughs> so I'm kind of, you know, all over the map a little bit, but I think, um, you know, I've sort of narrowed the search a little bit um, over the last couple months. Um, you know, I like the idea of hospitality. Um, you know, I've... <laughs> worked in restaurants. I enjoy restaurants. So of course people are like in the middle of a pandemic. Great. Nice, nice work. Um, but I think, you know, I, in, in thinking through like, what are my own talents and, you know, I like the, um, you know, consumer facing kind of, um, businesses like that. Um, and, and, you know, that could take a number of different forms. I am looking at businesses that have maybe a hospitality component, but also, you know, apartments or something, something to sort of diversify, um, revenue streams so that, you know, there are <laughs> sort of other um, ways to sort of hedge against something like this um, happening in the future. Those, those kinds of businesses that have maybe multiple facets to them. Um, and so, you know, it's open, as open as, po as possible. But again, I'm looking for, you know, similar things that Peter described too, you know, is, are the financials strong? Can, you know, and, and, and in part too, I'm, I'm, pretty open with this is for me this is a lifestyle choice that I'm making like I would like to be in this area um I love this area and so I'm trying to hedge against sort of that emotional reaction right because and not overpay or not um you know do something fairly reckless I have my own kind of consulting business on the side I'm a fundraiser by training and so you know I'm trying to keep those things separate but at the same time um establish some roots here um and and think about the you know my as a business owner, as part of the community, right? So it's not just about the business, it's how can I participate and make the community better? And, and, and I'm thinking through those kinds of opportunities. That's great. Chris, you seem really community minded and we were so excited to have you thinking about taking over a business here in the North country. You're also a 46er, right? That's, yeah. <laughs> um, so that's today, like but, you know, a couple of years ago. <laughs> Um, what do you think would make you successful in taking over a business in this region, you know, maybe that you haven't already described? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I've been part of part is, you know, I, getting to know the community, like, do I really know the community, right? I'm, I'm trying to, um, you know, have as many conversations with people who have, you know, I've spent a lot of time in Central Adirondacks. I don't know this area as well. Um, and so, but again, like I'm super open. I, I seek out those conversations. Um, I'm, I'm trying to understand what it's like to be part of this community and also what folks are thinking about in terms of their vision for the community. Like I'm, I'm, I think I've again, sort of narrowed in on Saranac Lake and I'm super like bullish about the future of Saranac Lake. And so, um, you know, I'm having a lot of conversations about like, what does that look like? Not like, what is it now, which is also great, but like, what, what could it be um, in the future? And so, you know, thinking through that um, again and, and, and trying to amplify other aspects of the community and kind of tie those things together um, again in hospitality and, you know, the farmer's market's amazing and sort of, you know, how do all of those pieces kind of fit together? Um, 
you know, I think it just sort of amplifies what any individual business can do, um, thinking through kind of consortiums and things like that. Um, and so, so yeah, I and mean, I think, again, like I, I have some <laughs> business background, you know, I have an MBA, so it's helpful, like I can put these financials together without being totally overwhelmed. Um, but at the same time, um, for me, it's, it's a little bit, it's a little bit more than that. Um, so hope that answers the question. And, you know, when you're putting those financials together, how are you thinking about determining the value of a business or what hurdles have you, you know, come across as you're thinking about putting those numbers together uh, with potential opportunities? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, many of the ho hosts today have already kind of <laughs> highlighted them, right? The income is not always reported in the way that it should be. And so like it throws, you know, throws all of the all of the numbers off um, and you sort of have to rely on different um different measures and you know I, you know the other thing i think that is that i found particularly challenging specifically about kind of restaurants um and thinking through rest there's just not that many comparables there's a sort of you know wave in kind of the north country of folks that have been running these operations for years under different rules right or different expectations and so you know when you think about okay what do i need for financing in order to get financing, those are questions they've not had to ask themselves. They, you know, again, the term EBITDA like is not is a foreign concept in some cases. And so trying to like just establish a common language with the seller has been challenging at times. Um, and so <laughs> here's my spreadsheet, right? Um, you know, is a little bit, you know, it's that, you know, we'll, it'll sort of devolve into a conversation. There is some emotional attachment at times, um, which I, again, can identify with, but um, it's, it's, it's hard to sort of find a common language around some of this sometimes, um, uh, which is difficult, right? It's sort of like, oh, I don't, you know, I don't do that, or I haven't done that, or, you know, and so, so it's possible that they may need the next three years, but I'm also an impatient person. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, it's sort of those, those kinds of things that have been a little bit challenging, right? Like, I want to, I want to move this now. You seller probably need three more years to get this to a point where I'm confident, and again, I'm, I'm, I tend to be, you know, impatient and not risk averse. And so I have to like rein that in sometimes um, and, and deal with this pragmatically and in the ways that, you know, again, everyone has talked about is a responsible way to think about things. So, yeah. Great. Well, and if, uh, if folks are interested in, in getting in contact with you, we can put them in touch uh, with you as well. Um, we're so excited to you know, have you take the time out of your day to, to share your insights. And, and thank you so much, both uh, you, Chrissy, and uh, Peter as well. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, so we do... Uh, we do have a little bit of time for, for Q&A. Uh, Rochelle, do you, or Christy, do you wanna take over any questions that might come up in the in the chat box for any of our speakers today? Sure. <clears throat> and folks, if you do wanna unmute yourself um, to ask a question, that's fine. Or if you just wanna add them into the chat box, that would be great. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. This is Mark Granger. I'd be interested, uh, as, as I'm a service provider for people in transition, as an attorney, I'd be interested in hearing from folks as to uh, what uh, things were most helpful to them in doing this and what were least helpful uh, from uh, the point of view of the service providers. Because sometimes, you know, people look at lawyers, for instance, as being a, a, either a drag or I, I say maybe a sea anchor when you're trying to make a decision that, you know, could put you uh, basically in a very testy financial situation uh, for a long time. And so I, I guess I'm curious as to, as people pro progress with the, the search to buy or to sell a business, uh, what did they think their, their lawyer did for them that was really helpful and what could they have done with that? I'm not sure. Does anybody want to attempt that question? I, um, 
Mark, are you looking at uh, as a buyer or seller or just in general? Well, I think in both directions, because, you know, as a, as a service provider for someone that's doing this, uh, you know, you have, uh, you know, for instance, dealing with the issue of the pandemic. Okay. How, what, how can you tell people, what do you say to people, or what's helpful to people in looking at that situation that might be from a legal point of view, or at least something that they would look to their lawyer to advise them on? Uh, you know, I've, I've been trying to keep up with everything, for instance, on all the regulations and all the changes, and I can answer those questions, but I'm not sure that that's what's helpful in the end to the people who are trying to either sell or buy. Uh, and I think lawyers sometimes have an interesting idea about what their value is that sometimes has nothing to do with how the client on either end of the transaction field. So just be interested, uh, you know, what did your lawyer do to help you? What, what <laughs> could you have done without, uh, you know, those sorts of things. What do you need? What do you think you need from a lawyer to help you uh, do this successfully? I, I can address a couple of things. Um, so uh, without question, lawyers help with the contract you know, and putting a very uh, tight contract together. When I bought Maui, it was a stock sale. So I assumed, my husband and I assumed all the liability of Maui North. Um, so that made it particularly important to have an ironclad contract that protected us as much as possible. Um, obviously an asset sale is better for a buyer if you can do it, but it depends upon what the seller is willing to do. When I sold Maui, um, the buyer's attorney wanted to try to negotiate the terms of the sale through our attorney. And that is, in my op opinion, absolutely not the right approach, right? Because then you're paying an attorney 300 plus or minus an hour to negotiate the terms of your, of your deal. And if, if you are not comfortable negotiating the terms of your deal, then maybe it's worth it to you to, to work with and through your attorney um, or potentially your accountant. But in my opinion, that is not the role of an attorney. An attorney is the person that puts the legal documents together and makes sure that you are protected and that everything is, uh, is as it should be in that regard. So that's just my personal experience. That, that's really interesting because from a legal ethics point of view, okay, the lawyer is is really only supposed to be talking to the other lawyer unless everybody agrees that, uh, so for instance, if the lawyer was talking to you, uh, he, he or she would have to clear it with your lawyer that he could do that. Well, then Mark, that's exactly the, their attorney wanted to negotiate through our attorney and yeah. I wouldn't let that happen because I yeah. wasn't going to spend the money for my attorney who wants nothing to do with the negotiation. To, yeah, I just, it. Well, you, you would need to make it clear that this is how it works. Okay. That's fine. But it is interesting. Anybody else have any questions for today's panelists? You can either type them in the chat box or ask them live. Well, if we're not gonna get any uh, other questions, you can always find us uh, at that ownnorthcountrybusiness.com. Uh, through the CBIT program. And uh, we're very appreciative that you joined us today and we hope that you got some helpful information and, and please feel free to reach out to any of us anytime. We're always here to help you, okay? Everybody have a great day. Thank you. Bye.